Thank you. Uh, I'm Cheryl Wassner. I'm the Associate Professor of Art at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Art uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. If that sounds familiar, it's because you've just heard from my colleague Douglas Dowd uh, not too long ago. So thank you again to Bureau and for the um, museum staff for organizing this conversation today. It's been really interesting. So I'll be talking today um, from the perspective of somebody who's been surrounded by signage hundreds and hundreds of pieces of it um, for well more than a decade. Commercial wooden signage has been a primary source of both material and meaning in my practice as a studio artist. I'll show, show you some examples of the work um, and show how I've responded to changes that I've seen in the way that commercial signs communicate, both materially and linguistically. So before this body of work began, uh, in my early 20s, I spent a great deal of time traveling. So when you're traveling, signs become objects of great significance, especially if you don't speak a common language. With simple words and graphics, signs tell you where you are and where you need to go. They give you direction. They tell you what you need. So I saw both the practical and the metaphorical potential in that. Topography and choices of arrangement are embedded in the visual culture of every place that I went. Some were carefully designed, where the maker's hand is obvious. Some were utilitarian and functional. Low-tech signage in particular seemed interesting to me. It revealed something about the person who made it. This one in Morocco seemed to be almost in a panic, um, showing about four different ways that this is a, a women's bathroom and not a men's bathroom. You see the planning, or lack of it. <coughs> and here, driving around the Midwest, coming from urban areas to small towns, I found vestiges of our own visual culture in Midwest Americana. There's a sense, looking at all of these signs, of who we once were, what we made, what we sold, how we got your attention. I noticed how we used language, how we used color, how we used materials, often hand painted, metal, neon. So signs always tell a story. We've seen and heard today, they operate at a cross section of aesthetics, materiality, function, language, public space, economics, commerce, technology, social history. So I started driving around my city, which was first in Cincinnati and now in St. Louis. I found fragments of discarded signage, scavenged from roadways and wastelands of commercial sprawl. The sides were the loud voices of city commerce, crowding our urban and rural landscapes with the insistent messages of industry. So I took them back to my studio. The language that I found on the signs was often direct and economical. So I asked myself, if language could be reduced to a system of shapes that have meaning based on arrangement and context, how does meaning affect it when the arrangement does not follow syntax? So first I had an interest in visual poetics, the subtleties of text-based shape that became architectural and their ability to build new symbols and new topographies. It began as an extension of my background in painting. How do I construct a painting rather than paint one? It's very similar to collage. It just requires a table saw instead of a pair of scissors. I was interested in the tension between the surface as a painted plane and the materiality of the wood, which revealed itself in the form of cracked paint and scuffed edges. Design decisions were both limited and informed by the particulars of the existing language, the anonymous designer, the site, and the physical qualities of the wood itself. I could see the overpainting, the bad registration of the vinyl, the screw holes that sometimes didn't go in straight. I took the silent exchange with the original sign maker seriously. Some pieces convey a sense of place. This is an old hotel sign. You can kind of see it's this commercial hotel. So I added interior details of wallpaper and punched tin metal. Most were found outside and had commercial residue. Here you can see the faded industry, old machines, warehouses. There's a nostalgic aspect to many of the pieces. There's history in the surfaces, grit, evidence of wear and weather. Signs that are no longer in use document things that are past, changed, or failed. When a business closes, the sign is often the last to go. 
I was at a store at Fifth and Main um, near my studio in Covington, and it was a business that was closing. It was a, hand, a family business from the 60s. The sign was a beautiful hand-painted deep enamel on a uh, ivory. And so I asked the man what he was doing with the sign when it closed. And he seemed very surprised that I wanted it. I tried to convince him that he should have it. I kept asking him, wasn't it sentimental to him? But he seemed really happy to get rid of it because to him, the sign re represented failure. I tried to pay homage to the sign's former site and use by titling it after a graphic symbol. In this case, the intersection of a Y and a K and the intersection of the street where I found it, so the intersection of Fifth and Main. This one borrows from 1960s modernism in a pretty direct way, I like a Kurt Schwitter's collage. I traveled with a portable circular saw in my trunk. I found this sign in an uh, old 1950s gas station site. It wasn't a gas station sign, uh, but I kept the reference. And although I usually don't paint on the signs, that one I sort of made a logo out of the K and changed the telephone number to look like three fuel prices. And then I put a little reference to homemade pie at the very bottom. I started to pay more attention to where I was finding the signs within the cities. I was scavenging them wherever I could find them, driving around places of the city that had high turnover, mostly local small businesses that now had shiny new vinyl real estate signs on them. I realized that signs acted as documentation of what the cities used to be like, the neighborhoods. The signs represented shifts in the city, gentrification, as this local hand-painted barbecue sign was being eventually replaced by a craft beer pub. It's at Taylor in Man Manchester in the Grove, if you know where that is. When I took this one down, there was almost a protest of people around me, thinking that I had something to do with the selling of their favorite barbecue stand. And then there was the recession. With the housing boom and then the recession, some of the only signs I could easily find were real estate signs. I didn't set out to collect them, it just happened. So I cut out the word real estate of all my signs, this one in particular, it's a Kaplan real estate company, and organized them to refer to urban sprawl. I titled the piece Sprawl, which is a shift from thinking about the titles in terms of documenting a place or a graphic symbol. I'm starting to think about the reorganization of the text, not in terms of what the language says, but what it does. I'm interested in creating a verb rather than a noun. The text should do something. This is an in-process shot of constructing the next piece. I wanted to activate the language to think about what we actually do with language. This one's called spin, which is a visualization of the way that we spin information to our advantage when communicating. So another process shot. I was interested in the idea of dialogue or the expectations of communication. The horizontal bands were an organizational structure that reinforced the expectation of reading across. So by cutting the sign in strips, I found that this cursive, which was a rare find, alluded to an Arabic-like language. The change in scale and density allowed, alluded to sound, soft and then shouting. The title of this one is Walled, which links it back to the original sign. It was a condominium advertisement that advertised walled terraces. You can sort of see the word walled in there. Um, but I also was thinking about it as uh, walled as a communication barrier. Oh, there we go. Multiple languages, uh, Arabic and uh, Romance languages, conversations that overlap and seem to cancel each other out. This is from a sign that said, coin laundry coming soon. The almost alignment of the O's and the N's is about anticipation. Therefore, the title, On Soon. I saw that it operated like a glitch, like a low-tech version of a scrambled computer screen, trying to align itself into meaning. The signs were getting less and less personal, less designed. I couldn't find hand-painted signs anymore. I just found a lot of Helvetica or standard fonts on white grounds, which were fast and cheap for the sign companies to make. They were never intended to stick around. I started thinking more about the role that technology plays in our interaction with text. The signs were like clips of data. I'm thinking about our visual and verbal environment, its constant flow of information, its sound equivalent, visual stutters, meaningless acronyms, technology glitches, text codes, filler. I thought about disrupted communication. 
This one's called decibel, which is a word to describe or measure a unit of noise. The piece is quiet at the edges and then opens up to a stuttering of sound bites in the center. You can start to see the influence of pixelization. I noticed the merging of signs with the idea of news in urban cities where signs wrap physical objects like buildings, not with advertising dinner hours, but with top political stories on CNN. I did a series of pieces called Towers of Babel that are more architectural in nature. With their clips of color and text set against a white background, they are self-referential to signage and advertising, with the vibrant noise and light of an urban commerce. Text spills around the edges like signage on a Times Square billboard or a building. The vertical structure resembles both the modernist skyscraper and the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, where human pride resulted in competing languages. The tower announces the 24-hour nonstop nature of text today, with clips of corporate acronyms and insider speech. And here are a wall of multiple conversations, a steady stream of dialogue. But as the signs and the discourse that I was referring to was getting less and less material, mine remained almost stubbornly wooden, much more like a clapboard than text messaging. And I knew this was sort of a problem. So I bought a vinyl cutter and I started making my own pieces, exploring manners of speech, which were far from the history, context-driven pieces from the past. This is diction, which is something very clean and precise. This one's called parlance, which is a manner of speaking. It's a, it's a play between the serif and the non-serif as a metaphor for the relationship between intuitive thinking and logical thinking. This is channel, so this is more about sound, speed, airwaves, streaming text that goes in and out of range. There's a feeling of technology on a clean, blank airspace, much more ephemeral. Some of the language here is fabricated, taken from what the word channel means and implies. Um, which is about air channels and about the connections between things. So I'm just going to end with a few examples of how this has led to other aspects of my studio practice. I've done some site-specific installations that use sign material and expectations of signage in a more poetic way. So here I'm putting vinyl on a bookstore window with the letters R-E-A-D um, in a big sort of sprawl. Put them on one by one with tweezers. I've worked with a couple of poets. Here, a poet who wrote a poem about the history of this building. Uh, I'm using vinyl as a physical material that responds to weather conditions and casts the language about the whole space. That led to some projects in gallery atriums. This one was uh, based on a series of found poetry about tornadoes and Midwestern weather. And finally, uh, another collaboration uh, with Stephanie Schlafer, uh, who was the poet from the last piece and who actually did her MFA in poetry right here in Iowa City, uh, where vinyl excerpts of poems appear on windows and walls that interact with the building and provide a narrative backdrop for sculptural objects. Time and patterns of light changed the way the words overlapped and interacted with the language on the walls, which created sounds, whispers, overlapping, repeating sentiments on the wall. And that's it.